This section will continue our discussion of p-values. I will discuss how p-values are used to conduct hypothesis tests and we'll talk about what it means for a result to be statistically significant. We concluded the previous section by presenting both a confidence interval and p-value for the body temperature data and discussed how both are intended to be interpreted contextually to help make inferential claims about the population mean body temperature. This process of interpretation and inference is somewhat informal, requiring the clinical researcher to synthesize relevant statistical, design, and clinical pieces of information to reach a conclusion. In many clinical research studies, it is not necessary to reach a crisp decision. Most studies are truly only intended to provide incremental knowledge to the area under study. In this context, it makes sense for there to be an evolving body of evidence within the literature contributed to by a variety of individual studies. No single study needs to make a definitive decision. However, this is not always the case. In some situations, there is a need to make a clear, crisp decision from a single study. Probably the most familiar example of this is a drug or device randomized trial regulated by the FDA where the goal may be to decide whether the drug or device should be recommended. In this situation, it is common for the success or failure of an entire randomized trial to be contingent on the p-value calculated for a single primary outcome of interest, usually an outcome measuring efficacy of the drug or device. Statistical hypothesis testing is a formal inferential method that automates decision making by essentially converting a p-value into a dichotomous conclusion that the result is either statistically significant or not statistically significant. Although the hypothesis testing approach is probably best suited for situations like FDA regulated drug trials, its use has been ubiquitous in peer-reviewed journals across many scientific disciplines. Here is how hypothesis testing works. First, define a threshold p-value for declaring whether a result is statistically significant. This threshold value is called the significance level of the test, is traditionally denoted by the Greek letter alpha, and is commonly set to a value of 0 0.05. The second step is to calculate the p-value and determine whether or not it is less than or equal to the significance level of the test. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis and conclude that the result is statistically significant. If the p-value is greater than alpha, fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the result is not statistically significant. A subtle but important point about the phrase fail to reject the null hypothesis relates to the relationship between the p-value and the null hypothesis. Remember that the p-value is calculated under the assumption of the null hypothesis being true and is constructed to be a measure of evidence against the null, not in favor of it. A small p-value does provide evidence against the null hypothesis. A large p-value does not provide evidence in favor of the null. Because the p-value is calculated under the assumed value of the null, it cannot provide evidence in favor of it, only against it. This is the reason that a failed hypothesis test should be characterized as fail to reject the null hypothesis, as opposed to accept the null hypothesis. Let's illustrate the use of a hypothesis test for the body temperature example. If we define the significance level of our test to be 0.05, then because the p-value, which is less than 0.0001, is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis and conclude the result is statistically significant. Remember that we originally specified a two-sided alternative for this example, so that when we say in favor of the alternative hypothesis, that simply means we conclude that the true population mean value is not equal to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 
As we indicated earlier, the value of the sample mean would lead us to conclude that the true population mean is less than 98.6, and the 95% confidence interval provides the likely range of values for the true mean. The important point about the two-sided alternative is that we entertain the possibility that the true mean could be more or less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We will discuss the use of a one-sided alternative momentarily. Let's look in a little more detail at the steps for conducting a hypothesis test. Before the data is collected, state the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Define a threshold value for declaring p-value significant, the significance level of the test, denoted by alpha, commonly set to 0.05. Select an appropriate statistical test. We will be introducing and discussing the most commonly used statistical tests in the next two modules. After the data is collected, perform the statistical test and calculate the p-value. If the p-value is less than alpha, or less than or equal to alpha, conclude the result is statistically significant, reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Otherwise, conclude that the difference is not statistically significant and decide to not reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Let's look at a second example of conducting a hypothesis test using the blood pressure data from previous modules focusing on systolic blood pressure as the outcome. Looking at the summary statistics for this data, the sample was comprised of 149 patients admitted to the hospital with a mean systolic blood pressure of 144.5. Let's assume that the question of interest is whether or not the mean systolic blood pressure in this population of patients is greater than 140, indicating some level of hypertension. We can conduct a hypothesis test to answer this question by assuming the null hypothesis to be a population mean systolic blood pressure of 140 and the alternative hypothesis to be a population mean systolic blood pressure greater than 140. This is an example of a one-sided alternative hypothesis. Let's select a traditional significance level of 0.05. The resulting p-value is equal to 0.005. Because this value is less than our significance level of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis and conclude that the result is statistically significant. That is, the true population mean systolic blood pressure is greater than 140. People will often say something like, in this population of patients, the true population mean systolic blood pressure is statistically significantly greater than 140 based on a hypothesis test conducted at the 0.05 level. Of course, one of the hazards of making a clear-cut decision is that we may make a mistake. By using a decision framework that bases conclusions on the value of a probability, which is what the p-value is, we necessarily incur the possibility of making a mistake. What if in reality the null hypothesis is actually true in this case and we have rejected the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis based on the outcome of this hypothesis test? Then we have made a mistake. There are actually two types of mistakes that one can make when conducting hypothesis tests. The mistake described above is an example of what is called a type 1 error. Not surprisingly, the second type of error is called a type 2 error. We will continue this discussion in the next segment.